Hello, thank you for coming and joining this session. Uh, this, I, I didn't know what to put here, so I tried to find something fancy. Uh, probably I have something with rocks. Uh, so this, before uh, a little bit about me, uh, I'm Mauricio, uh, I'm from Uruguay. Uh, for those who doesn't know where it is, uh, it's a, a small country between Brazil and Argentina. So um, I'm engineering director at NetLabs, a company based in Montevideo. We provide consulting services um, to private and companies um, uh, in the government. I'm also, at, I teach uh, at Ort uh, University, a uh, local university in Uruguay, uh, in the cloud and DevOps uh, subjects. So, a little bit about this uh, session, a little bit about this talk. It's not about the, the workload, because um, the, that is something impossible to, to identify, to specify. So it's not, it's not really about the, the workload. Um, op, open source is about community, it's about sharing. And that is something that I want to do. I want to share some uh, learned lessons with you the, um, during all these years uh, working with Kubernetes uh, platforms. But also you can expect uh, some scaling tools and strategies for, to apply in a daily basis. You may be interested for, for you as well. So let's begin. I, I organized this talk uh, into four bottlenecks that later uh, I call them uh, rocks because it's that they are, they are stones in the, in the path to escape to infinity and, and beyond. But I, I really want to emphasize how important it is to try to s smash these, these rocks, these stones that are uh, impeding me, impeding us to scale. So I, I, I asked the, the marketing team to uh, illustrate this, uh, this epic battle against those stones in the, in the path. Uh, and then they can with this. Okay, so, so, sorry, sorry for drama, but actually, um, yeah, the, uh, it's a kind of uh, a really good f way of emphasize how, how epic could be this battle. So let's begin with the rock number one, which is scaling the, the, the workload. Right? The, this is actually the easy piece part of scaling uh, application because you know it's only uh, it's only about scaling pods and for that I need to choose a, a, a Kubernetes distribution let's let's say that I have a Kubernetes, a Kubernetes based on EKS so you know you may uh, you may know that we have uh, HPA for scaling workloads right HPA stands for Horizontal Pod Auto Scaler, which is something, uh, it's like a kind of a standard. And then you have the VPA, the Vertical Pod Auto Scaler. If you want to add replicas to the, the, of the application, use HPA. If you want to modify limits and requests, you, you use VPA. So let's concentrate in HPA, which is uh, that I want to emphasize something. So what is the thing with uh, HPA? In the worst case scenario, HPA will, at very, in the worst case scenario, HPA will take at up to one minute and a half to scale the pods. So in a really critical applications, this could lead into a, a really unhappy users waiting for our application to scale. So a better approach could be use something about uh, like KIDA. Do you know what is KIDA? Yeah. 
KIDA stands for uh, Kubernetes Event Driven Auto Scaling, which is a, a new strategy for our, our scaling uh, pods, but in an event driven fashion way. See? Yeah? So, with KIDA, KIDA will, will work in tandem with uh, the scheduler and will, uh, sorry, not the scheduler, but HPA, and will uh, scale that pod into uh, kind of seconds. So, you have, we have different scaler. We have a new entity called a scaler, which is basically the, the, the kind of event that we want to react on. For example, we have a scaler uh, for Rabbit MQ. We have a scaler for Prometheus. We can scale pods based on uh, different uh, Prometheus metrics. We have um, a lot of, we have Kafka. We have a lot of um, scalers, yeah? Um, there is a, um, there, there, there is a, a particular scaler that I would like to mention, which is the HTTP request which is uh, non-official, but also is uh, supported by community around KIDA, and which is uh, a scaler for a scale based on the amount of HTTP requests. And one particular use case for uh, this scaler is that you can um, idle applications. For example, if you set that the minimum amount of pods is zero, at the very first request that you receive, KIDA will uh, scale the, the applications to the amount of pods that is necessary and will react in that way. So we can have a even driven, but also a idle strategy for, for saving costs, for example. The, 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 this was the, the easy piece part. Now, we need to talk about the, the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure. This is not so hard because, you know, we have an EKS, we have cluster autoscaler, right? But the, catchy, the catch is that in the worst case scenario, cluster autoscaler will take uh, up to four minutes, between four minutes and five minutes to spin up new nodes. That is because under the hood, cluster autoscaler is based on autoscaling groups. Yeah? So, a smarter approach could be to use a Carpenter. Do you know what is Carpenter? It's, it's a little bit more uh, no technology. Sorry, what? Yeah, that is the catch. Um, the colleagues say that it's only for AWS. Yeah, it's true. It's a, for now, there is a roadmap. <laughs> Sorry, what? There's a provider for Azure, and then Carpenter was going to be the uh, application. Okay, so fresh news, fresh news. We have fresh news. Thank you. Yeah, actually, the, 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 the roadmap is uh, that Carpenter will extend the, the support for different uh, cloud providers. So. Right now, um, Carpenter uses a, a just-in-time approach, which means uh, will provision new nodes based on, on, on demand, yeah, but going directly to the EC2 instance, uh, EC2 APIs, directly to the bones without autoscaling groups. So you can you, you pass from four or five minutes to spin up a new node two seconds, yeah? And there is an additional feature that is very important, at least for me, which is uh, the fact that Carpenter works in tandem with the, the scheduler, which means that if you have pods in pending state, then Carpenter will force the scheduler to uh, reschedule those pods in pending state. So, a really good combination could be to use Kira plus Carpenter instead of Cluster Autoscaler um, and HPA uh, Pure. 
So, all good? So, let's pass the hand to the rock number three. And this is the tricky part of the, of the uh, uh, scaling. So, control plane boundaries is more like a, in the control plane we have different uh, components, you know. But I had to use some of them because I couldn't tackle all of them. So, during my research, some investigation that, uh, that I did, I found that the most tricky parts are related to the API server, core DNS service, and something related to the pod density. So, let's get into one of uh, each of them. Related to the API server, you may know that uh, you have two parameters, which are max request in flight and max mutating request in flight, which is uh, for controlling the, the maximum request that the API server will support in a given time. But there is a, there is a catch. In, in managed services such EKS, this is a, 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 a default value that we cannot modify. We, we, we don't have the, 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 the option to modify this. So, those value are for, in case for a max request in flight is 400, and in case for max mutating request is uh, 200. Uh, the difference between request and mutating request is the, some of them is for read-only operation, and the other is, uh, for example, create, uh, modify uh, operations. So, in case uh, of EKS, those values are managed, and we cannot modify it, supposedly the, 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 out, the API server should increase those values on demand, but that is something that we don't have information how it works. We don't have visibility in that. So, there is another component, which is APF. APF stands for API Priority and Fairness. That is a future uh, starting from Kubernetes 1.22-23, I believe, this, which is uh, enabled by default. In EKS, it's also enabled, and in that case, the amount, the, the default concurrency for our API server is the sum of uh, both value, the sum of max request in-flight and max mutating request in-flight. So, Remember this number because, uh, because we will need them in a, in a minute. So, how, how API, uh, APF works? We have uh, an object called flow schema, which is basically for identify uh, and classify a request. And we have uh, the priority levels, which is defined how, how the requests in a given uh, priority are handled. When we have the flow schema is tied to a priority level. So with this, we can, um, we can classify the requests and prioritize them according to the criticity of the, the application. So what about if we want to calculate how many requests are allowed for a specific workload? Well, we, we need to do some, some math. So, imagine that I would like to uh, calculate what is the default concurrency for a workload with um, nominal concurrency shares uh, 120, 120. The nominal concurrency shares is basically the portion of the amount, of the whole amount of concurrency that we can support. It's a portion. So, for calculate what is the, 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 the concurrency for a, the, uh, a specific workload, we need to grab the total available concurrency, the 600, the value of 600. Then the total of nominal concurrency shares that is uh, in all my, my, my implementation, in my, all my clusters. And then the nominal 
nominal concurrency share of the specific workload that I would like to calculate the, 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 um, the concurrency. And all of this put in a math and this will give you, give you the, the workload concurrency. For example, if we have 120, that is the, the nominal concurrency shares for, for the, that specific workload, we need to grab the 600 and multiply by the division between 120, which is the concurrency of the nominal concurrency of the, of the workload, divide by the amount of all nominal concurrency shares. And that is the result is approximate 187 requests using uh, 120 as an example. So when, when we receive the request and that request is validated, the APF mechanisms classify into a flow schema and a priority level and then put it into a queue or execute the request, depends on the result. Yeah? So, this, is, this was regarding the uh, control plane. There are, there are some other uh, strategies, but those, was the, those were the, the most important. So, the other component, the other strategy that we, we can uh, tackle in order to uh, scale our control plane is to um, work in the coordinate service. Related to this, we have two options. We have the possibility to modify n dots configuration and turn on no local DNS cache. And dots configuration basically specify how many dots in a domain are considered enough to avoid querying coordinates service. You know, if you have, uh, if your application needs to resolve an external uh, uh, domain such as uh, api.application.com, this means that uh, and we have a n dots configuration in phi, which is the, the default value. This means that for each domain, the search domain in my configuration uh, will be append to the uh, domain that I would like to resolve. And the result is that before fail resolution, I will uh, the coordinate service will be queried four times before that. The result is that I will overload the API and coordinate service because I need to, because of this configuration. So for work around this, we can work a, a, a pot level modifying the end dot configuration. For example, setting the value in two will work, yeah? because we have two dots in the api.application.com. So, uh, unfortunately, this is a, um, a configuration that we need to uh, apply at pot level. Uh, it's not something that we could modify in the, um, in the core DNS service at itself. We could potentially work around on this, but it's not a, it's not a possibility right now. So the other strategy is to, um, is to configure uh, some service called node local DNS cache, which is basically install a cache a DNS in each uh, node, and then the, the pod will try to re re resolve the service, first consulting the, the local cache, and then if this cache doesn't have the the, the, the domain, the, the result will be bypass, will bypass the, the cache and consulting the coordinates service. This also contributes to reduce the API server uh, request amount uh, and of course also collaborate with uh, avoid API server store. So 
regarding the pod density, which is pod density, pod density basically is how many pods uh, you can handle per each node, right? In, in EKS, we have the possibility to uh, configure two parameters. One is the custom networking, which is basically for uh, providing a secondary uh, VPC CIDR for pod IP space. So we will separate the user, the worker space from the pod, pod IP space. The result is that because Carpenter or Cluster Autoscaler, they, they don't know what is the, 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 the amount of IP th that I have. So they will spin up new nodes and we, we don't have uh, IP reservation for, for, for the pods. So with this strategy, uh, enabling custom networking, we will provide one uh, subnet for uh, pod IP space and one subnet for the worker nodes. The other, the other parameter that we could use in order to increase the amount of pods is uh, enabling prefix dele delegation. Instead of uh, assign one IP uh, for a pod, you assign basically, um, you assign for e each interface um, a slash 28 uh, range. You, 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 you assign a prefix and the, the pod will grab uh, an IP from that, that prefix. This is useful when it's not possible to use uh, IPv6. So, what we should use? Custom networking or prefix delegation? Basically, actually, we, we, we can use them both. It's not, it's not that one or, or, or the other. In order to increase the amount of uh, available IP for, for, for the pods, we could use uh, both. So, the rock number four and the, the last one is the monitoring. Monitoring is essential because, you know, uh, monitoring is, is the, it's an important thing, but it's the, 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 the thing that we take care of the less, I believe. So, imagine this. You have a call from your monitoring system in the middle of the night, you are on call, and probably you will start to check uh, compute resources, You're looking for resource starvation at instance level, check CPU, memory, disk, IOPS. So if you have the metrics and the, the monitoring, probably you will try to find resource starvation, but at worker node, basically, which is uh, looking for uh, out of memory in the pod, or uh, if you have a big pod in a big test state. But we, we have been talking about uh, the control plane. So um, a smarter approach could be to use dedicated panels and metrics for the control plane. So, and for, uh, fortunately, Kubernetes has uh, a lot of um, metrics that we could use for uh, grabbing, get, gather all, all those uh, statistics and putting into some monitoring system. We have related to the APF, we have, we have more, but we have for uh, show the limit of execution uh, seats, I, I mean the, the concurrency, uh, show how, how long uh, it takes to execute requests in a, in a different priority level, or show how many requests are in the queue. We have different metrics related to the APF, but also we have the bugging endpoints for consulting into um, when we are troubleshooting the, 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 the issue. So, those metrics we can basically gathering uh, using the kubectl command line tool, but also we could graph all those metrics, you know. Uh, there are several uh, already prepared Grafana dashboard for graphing these uh, metrics. 
but basically it's, it's not so hard. And we have, for example, having the, the total of in-fly requests uh, that my cluster support, Perch API server nodes. And basically we can do whatever we want with these metrics. But not just the APF, we should, in order to know what is going on in, in our cluster, we need to uh, try to identify issues related to the etc. D. Uh, DNS latency. If we use Carpenter, we have different metrics that Carpenter uh, showed up in order to um, visualize what is the performance of the of the of the, the system. Um, another approach is uh, to use open telemetry. I, I don't know if you know what is open telemetry, but basically, is uh, becoming the standard in observability. That, that is because it's a, a new way of presenting metrics, a new way of um, gathering metrics. And there are several, several um, monitoring systems that already support uh, open telemetry. In fact, uh, there is a, a, an add-on for EKS, which is basically with a click, you can install the, this add-on and install all the engineer engine inside Kubernetes for gather all those metrics and having the open telemetry um, extension. So we're approaching the final, but I would like to uh, mention some takeaways. It's, it's important to, to work on these rocks before it's too late, because otherwise you will you will troubleshoot in the in the during the road, during the ride. Um, also, it's important to know the boundaries of your services because, you know, it's not uh, cloud computer uh, providers. They are not um, give you uh, compute resource, uh, unlimited compute resource. They have limits. And we, we need to know them in order to bypass them. So knowing the, the, the boundaries is uh, um, a special important part of the architecting things. And the last thing is try to learn things under the hood, how it works, because otherwise we will, we will be lost uh, and we will try to shoot without uh, knowing what, what we are doing. So, I don't have a Q&A session, but if you have any questions, just I'm, I'm here for, for, for talking. If not, we can uh, talk outside, but thank you. Yeah, um, there, there is a thing, there is no one, all, uh, one simple solution. The, the question was if I consider to scale to multiple clusters. One, one thing is to have different clusters in different providers and try to have some, um, some layer on top of those clusters and try to move in workloads from one on, on the other. The other thing is if you want to share something uh, in, the, in the control plane level. Yes, I have considered and we have implemented both, but there is a, there is a um, catch in different installations, in different architectures. But they are, are independent because if, we, if, we, if I mix in uh, provider, for example, if I uh, have some workloads over EKS and have some workloads uh, over AKS, and I want to expand and I want to scale, the, the, they have di different rules. So maybe I can use Carpenter for for scaling some 
uh, some part of the implementation, but I need to have a different strategy for the, the other provider. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that, that is something that you will resolve at application level. But uh, in the traffic, in the, in the networking layer, it's a different thing. Actually, we could spend a month talking about Kubernetes uh, networking because it's, the, it's the, the hardest point. Yeah, actually, ne next year we'll come back to talk about uh, networking in Kubernetes, probably. Uh, uh, hi. So uh, the talk title was one million users, right? So uh, I have a question. Uh, in your preference, uh, what it should be like, more number of clusters with less number of nodes or less number of clusters with more number of nodes? If we talk about one cluster, I, I prefer few nodes, but with uh, high compute because um, the footprint that each node has for, for, for support all the, the Kubernetes engine uh, is uh, you will get better performance if you have um, higher nodes, bigger nodes, instead of several nodes, but um, with less computer resource. Because it depends on, on the implementation. It's not the same if you have just deployments or pods running on, in your node, but if you have daemon sets, it's a different thing because you know each daemon set reserves some, uh, the resource of, for each node. So depends on really on the, the, the amount of workload, the, the type of workload that you need to, to deploy on those clusters. 